Good morning, Storehouse friends and family, and welcome to our online service. I'd just like to let you guys know about a few things that happened this week in the life of our church, starting with Tuesday. We had our third Zoom prayer meeting, which is really great. We got to pray for our nation and some rain, which God really unbelievably blessed us with this week, which we're so grateful for. Um, on Wednesday, a few of our comms met online and they got to fellowship and connect with each other, which is really great. 
On Thursday, we had our first pack and pray meeting, which is really great. Um, we got to pack 400 food packs, which is going to feed about 2,000 people, which is just incredible. Um, we had a group of guys that came out in the freezing cold, which is really amazing and so um, generous of them. Um, and then the most important thing that we did on Thursday, guys, we made a friend. <laughs> So um, our staff decided that um, we needed a friend to join us on staff. And there you go, everyone. Meet our snowman. He's in our freezer, held captive. <laughs> One more exciting announcement, guys. Storehouse will be starting our very own podcast. Our first episode will be going out this week sometime, so stay tuned for that. The last thing I'd like to let you guys know about is that our president is addressing the nation tonight. We are hopeful that he is going to be dropping some of the regulations and hopefully that we can meet next week Sunday. Um, but we're not too sure that he's going to be doing that so please keep an eye out on social media and your messages on some information on what's happening next week Sunday. Um, I hope you guys have a blessed Sunday and I'm going to be handing over to Graham who is going to be doing our word for today. Well, good morning, friends. If you're watching this, it means that you have survived one of the coldest weeks that I think we in, in PE at least have experienced in a very long time. At the church, we don't have a temperature gauge, but what we do look for is that if, if Bruce comes to work in long pants and not shorts, then we know that something terrible has happened. And this week, Bruce came to work with long pants, a jersey, a jacket, and a beanie. So it really has been unbelievably cold this week and we are really looking forward to some warm weather in the, in the months to come. Um, but we as a church have been having a conversation, we've been having a discussion around this theme of encounters and encountering God. And there is a, a cliche, if you're a Christian, I'm sure you have heard this uh, many, many times. And I'm asking that when I say these words that you would pretend with me that this is the first time that you've ever heard this. When I say that there is a difference between knowing about God and knowing God. Just like there is a difference between knowing about lightning and being struck by lightning. I know about lightning. I know it's that flashy light stuff that happens in the sky at night. Um, but I've never been struck by lightning. I have no idea what that feels like. And I bet it is far more interesting to talk to someone who has been struck by lightning than to talk to someone like me who only knows it as that flashy stuff that happens in the sky. Um, and the world needs people who don't just know about Jesus, but who really know Jesus, who walk closely with God their Father and, and have a deep rooted meaningful relationship on a daily basis with him so the title of my message this morning is encountering power and i want to talk today about power i want to talk about strength i want to talk about overcoming the darkness i want to talk about breaking through about breaking the jaw of the enemy about shouldering our responsibility, about bearing up under the unbearable, um, about moving forward, about pressing on, about taking ground, about getting up off the mat and dusting ourselves off and about getting the job done. And I want to talk about who we are. You know, during this time I've stopped and I've asked this question, as a people, who are we? Who are we really? Are we helpless? Um, are we a people without hope? Are we a people without vision? Are we a people without purpose? And as I ask these questions, I hear the resounding voice of the Father saying no, that we are not those things, that we are a powerful people, that we are a people with vision, we are a people filled with strength, that we are a people filled with hope, and that we are a people filled with with purpose and I hear the words of the writer in Hebrews 10 verse 39 that says but we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed but to those who have faith and are saved that is something of who we are and there is a a, a term that has been 
uh, attributed to Aristotle, although it is a, a little bit of a misquote by him. But it talks about the, the whole being greater than the sum of the parts. So that means that if I have two batteries, um, uh, I don't have the power. If I have one battery, I have the power of one battery. But if I have two batteries, I have the power of ten batteries. One plus one doesn't equal two. One plus one equals ten. And there is a, a power and a strength in our unity as a body. That's why I'm so passionate about this thing called unity. Because when we get together, all of us on our own have the strength and the power of, of, of one um, Christian. But, but when we gather together with the same heart, the same vision, the same purpose to, to get on with the job and to get the job done, the, the sum of our unity together um, is so much greater than, than we can accomplish as individuals. And, and this is a spiritual principle that we see in Joshua 23 verse 10. It says, One man of you puts to flight a thousand, since it is the Lord your God who fights for you, just as He promised. So what this is saying is that one individual filled with the, the power and the strength of God, with God on their side, can accomplish the, the impossible. One of you can put a thousand to flight. But then in Deuter Deuteronomy, I think it's 32 verse 30 or verse 30 verse 32, somewhere about there, it talks about one can put a thousand to flight, but two can put 10,000 to flight. And there is a power, there is a strength, there is a purpose and a destiny when we come together. We are not helpless. We have a hope and we have a future. And there's three things that I want to talk about this morning. That when we work together and, and when we have faith in God, that we are empowered in these three areas. We are empowered to be warriors. Not warriors with an O, but warriors with an A. Fighters. We are empowered to be warriors. We are empowered to be workers and we are empowered to be worshippers. So warriors, workers and worshippers. I want to talk very briefly about those three things this morning. So we see very clearly in the book of Nehemiah. Um, Nehemiah is a man who is called by God to rebuild the broken walls. The walls of the city have been broken and the enemy is rushing in. And not only is he called to be a worker and a builder, but he's working and he's building in a hostile environment. So while some are building the walls, others are standing guard with their swords drawn and ready. At other times they are, have got a spade in one hand and a sword strapped to their side or a sword in the other hand. And that's the, how they had to build. And that is such an applicable and relatable example for us in our country that we are, are rebuilding, and not just this country, but all over the world, that, that the enemy has come in as, and has caused such division and such strife, and the world is waking up to chaos every day. And we are called to build the kingdom of God in a hostile environment. We need to be powerful workers and warriors at the same time. And I want to talk a little bit about this thing called being a warrior, being a fighter. And I want to tell you about Operation Fortitude and Operation Mincemeat. So I'm, I love learning about the Second World War. And in the Second World War, you had the Allied powers, um, Britain, America, France, some of those guys. And you had the Axis power, Germany, uh, Japan, some of, some of those guys on that side. And the Allied powers were planning an attack. I think the attack was somewhere in Italy. And they wanted to deceive and fool the enemy. So they, they had this operation called Operation Mincemeat, where they got a dead body and they dressed him up like an Allied a soldier, an allied officer, and they hid certain documents on this body. They went through extreme lengths. They even put a ticket stub for a movie. They made up a whole backstory of this man's life, and they hid some important documents on him. They hid enough documents to make it look realistic, um, but not enough to make it look like a, a ruse, which it was. 
And they put this dead body on a submarine and they snuck up to the enemy coast and they basically launched this dead body who washed ashore and the enemy found this body and they fell for this deception hook, line and sinker. They diverted their forces and the Allied army, army was able to attack because of that small little deception. They were able to attack um, and they were able to overcome the enemy and that that Operation Mincemeat helped lead to the downfall of um, uh, Mussolini, who was uh, the Italian dictator at the time. There was another operation called Operation Fortitude, where the Allies were going to land on the beaches of Normandy, but they wanted to divert some of the, the Germany's forces. So they built an entire army out of inflatables. Uh, inflatables are, you know, basically jumping castles, um, those kind of things. They built inflatable uh, tanks and they built inflatable uh, trucks and inflatable airplanes. And they camouflaged this inflatable army um, just poorly enough that the enemy reconnaissance airplanes would spot them, um, but well enough that it wouldn't look obvious. And Hitler himself was convinced that the Allies were not going to land on the beaches of Normandy, but were going to land in another area because the Allies had positioned this fake army um, across the channel in that other position. And because of that, the Allies were able to land on Normandy and were able to be victorious. Who knows what, have, what would have happened if Hitler and the Axis powers did not fall for that deception. And what I see at this time is a great deception and a great ruse. And I see a great amount of Christians falling for this deception. The Bible says in Ephesians 6 verse 12 that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So I'll give you an example. I saw a, a, a post by a well-known uh, pastor who said that he had gotten the vaccine. And the comments against that pastor, there were a number of people saying with judgment and with, with anger and bitterness towards him, saying, I thought you were a man of God. I'll never trust you. I'll, you'll never find me in your church ever. And, and I look at that and, and my heart is grieved because what I see is I see Christians who have fallen for a, a, a ruse, who have fallen for a deception, who are fighting each other and are, are not unified in the strength that I've talked about, where one puts a thousand to flight, two puts ten thousand to flight. I see Christians who are weakening the body of Christ because they are fighting their own battles. I see Christians who every single day will post something on social media about some issue related to something, but you will not find them within a hundred meters of a prayer meeting ever because the, the thing that they are consuming is, is not the Word of God. It's not fighting the spiritual battle that the Word of God instructs us to do. It's fighting other Christians. It's fighting the government. It's fighting the unsaved. And I'm not saying that we must be unaware of the things that are happening in the world. I'm saying do not fall for the trap. Do not, Paul tells us to fight the good fight, not fight the fake fight or the stupid fight, but fight the good fight. Um, be obedient to the Word of God, what the Word of God says, not what you see. Don't be distracted. You are a warrior and you need your, your fighting for the kingdom of God is important and it makes a difference. In 2 Chronicles 20 verse 15 it says, uh, He said, Listen King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours but God's. And there's two ways to approach it. The one way is to find strength and courage that, that it is not us who, who fights the battle, but actually it is God's battle and He fights the battle for us and we can rest in knowing that, that God is the victor and He fights for us. But there's another way and a perspective to look at this is that 
You, when a nation goes to war and when you are called to fight in a battle, you drop what you are doing and you go and fight that battle. So you may have your own battle at home. Maybe you and your neighbor are in a dispute about land. Maybe your neighbor has wronged you and maybe your neighbor is trying to take your possessions or has, has hurt you or, or disturbed your life in some way. Maybe that's the battle that you're fighting. And then the king calls you to go and fight his battle. You drop your battle and you go and you fight the king's battle. And when that battle is done and won, then you go back home and then you fight your own battle. And I see so many Christians fighting their own battles, fighting about vaccinations, fighting about all sorts of other stuff, fighting other Christians, fighting, fighting everybody except fighting God's battle. And we are in a place now where we need to lay down our own thing and fight God's battle. Fight for God. Fight for the kingdom of God. Fight for the lost and the hurting to get them in to the kingdom. Not fighting for your position on what you believe because of what you have read on the internet. But fighting for the kingdom of God. Fighting for the word of God. Fighting for the people of God to see his kingdom come and his will be done. And laying down our own battles. So that's what it means to be a warrior. We fight his battles. We don't fight our own. Um, the second thing is to be a worker. And I think it is important for us to understand that we have something to offer this world. That we really do. We had a, a, a meeting this week, an emergency meeting, which we were allowed to do, where we called it a pack and pray. And we got together, and um, as you would have heard in the announcements, but for me, there was just such a wonderful laugh here. Um, <clears throat> there was such a positivity, such a vibrancy. As we got together and we, we did something for some, uh, someone other than ourselves and we packed some food that that we trust would would be a blessing to others and then we got together and we prayed for what we had done we said God every single packet that has been made with love may it find a home in need and may your presence fill that home and we were honest and we were sincere and I believe that we really accomplished something on that evening and and um, we have something to offer this world and there is a new season of rebuilding of rebuilding that lies before us there is a, a season of picking up the broken pieces of this world and in the mighty name of Jesus Christ mending them together and making something wonderful the world needs workers it needs workers for the kingdom of God workers who will establish the kingdom of God in this world we cannot afford to be distracted by our own comforts and our own pleasures and our own issues and the own uh, our own difficulties and circumstances we need to work to build the kingdom of God in this world we are we are in a world that is becoming aware I think of, of what happens when you take church out of society, what happens when you take biblical principles out of society. And what this world needs is people who are willing to put their hand to the plow, to leave their own fields and to go and build the fields of the kingdom of God. So that's warriors, that's workers. And the last one is worshipers. Worship is what makes us resilient. It is what makes us strong. It is what makes us powerful. It is the source of our strength. It is the moment when we come into contact with lightning. It is the moment when we tap into that source of eternal power and strength. When we lay our lives down and we make it all about Him and not about us. Um, and the world is in desperate need of worshippers. Uh, I've been so encouraged over the years as, as I've seen people in, the, in, the, in the, this body and in this church who have gone through unbelievable difficulties and trials. I think about Gail who testified two weeks ago when she lost her sister and, and what she did was she turned on the worship music and in her pain and in her heartache and in her and in the worst moment of her life, worship was there, a source of power, a source of strength for her to pick her up 
in the worst moments of her life and in our best moments and in our worst moments we are worshipers like David no matter what happens to us no matter the world crumbles and falls around us our eyes are on Jesus and our heart is uplifted as we worship him with everything that we are as, as we encourage each other to worship him and it is so sad for me as I think that the last time that we were able to worship corporately as one body and one heart, I think was on the 27th. That's when we went into lockdown of March of 2020, a year, almost a year and a half ago, um, that we haven't been able to gather in our full capacity and, and worship. And I think, as I said before, that the world is seeing that, that effect the chaos that's been released in the world as, as the church hasn't been able to gather and worship. Um, and and there's, we've seen this drift from biblical uh, sources and, and, and chaos just seems to be uh, consuming our world. And, and my encouragement for you is that you would take every single opportunity, no matter how big, no matter how small, if it's online, if it's 50 of us, um, no matter what we do, I, I, I pray and my, and my heart is to see a hunger for worship to rise up amongst us that if we are able to meet as 50, we could meet every single night of the week to worship. There's no, there's been no restrictions for that. And I, I'm eager to see a hunger for worship just to burst forth from us, to overflow from us. If we have to do it over WhatsApp calls on, on Zoom, online, in person, at work, during lunch times, whenever, that our heart would be to worship God with absolutely everything that, that we have inside of us. We have been empowered to be fighters, to be warriors, to be workers and to be worshipers. And when we do those things, we mold and we shape and we change the spiritual atmosphere around us. We do warfare in the spirit as God has called us to do. And we see a real difference on the ground, in the lives, in the, in the hearts every single day, in the hearts and the minds of, of people. As we begin to realize, my prayer is that the, the deception of the enemy that has told us that, that what we do doesn't make a difference. I pray that that would just fall off of us. I pray that the Spirit of God would just fall upon us to such a degree that we would recognize and that we would understand that what we do, that what one or two of us do in this body, in this church, can make a difference in this nation. And I pray that, that as I say these words, that something of the anointing of God would fall upon you and that you would recognize that what you do can make a difference and that we are not a people without power. We are not a people without hope. We are not a people without vision, but that we are a people who move in the presence and the power of God and that we can make a difference. So as we go into a time of, of worship, uh, I pray that you would just um, commit your hearts in prayer as I pray over us. So Father God, I thank you for your power. I thank you for your anointing. I pray that Whoever hears this message, wherever they hear it, would sense your presence, would sense your anointing fall upon them. I pray, Father God, that we would come united in our, in, in our fight. We would come united in our work. We would come united in our worship for you. And that as we do that, Father, I pray that, the, um, the, that us as a whole would be greater than the sum of our parts, that we would realize and we would recognize that we stand upon this, this nuclear uh, bomb of, of power that you want to release in the city, release in this nation, release in the world, and you've chosen to do it through us, your church. I thank you, Father, for your power. I pray may it flow through our veins, and, and I pray that, that we would see your kingdom come and we would see your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Try.
the battle rages, we will stand in the fight. Though the armies rise up against the sorrow of sight, we will not be shaken. We will not be shaken. We will not be shaken.
worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of all the breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show.
your heart.